Okay, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Mary Domsky here to speak about Rule 3 in Part 3 of Newton's Principia and about how gravity gets universalized. Professor Domsky is currently the Associate Dean uh, for Curriculum and Instruction at the College of Arts and Sciences at UNM down in Albuquerque. Um, she's a professor of philosophy who has written extensively on issues involved in history and philosophy of science. According to one admirer of her work, she is a master of unpacking with rare insight the large implications contained in small details of historical writing. Professor Domsky revealed to me over dinner this evening that she has won all possible teaching awards at UNM, including the College of Arts and Sciences Award for Excellence in Teaching, and that she was once a star player in a major NBA basketball team. <laughs> she then said that only one of those things wasn't true, uh, but she neglected to say which one. Please join me in welcoming Professor Domsky. I think my height gives away which one is false. Thank you. Um, this June, it will be three years since I've given a talk, and so thank you for getting me off the sidelines. Thank you for being here, and thank you for the opportunity. Mike okay? Okay. Um, so, as Grant said, and as the title indicates, the focus this evening will be Rule 3 of the Principia. And I am going to argue for a, what I call a non-standard, brand new reading of this one sentence. But to get us started, uh, let's orient ourselves and recall where the rules, there are four in total, you might remember. They're presented at the beginning of book three, where Newton is presenting his system of the world and arguing for universal gravitation. And they are basically directives or rules for how to reason about evidence, how the natural philosopher should engage with evidence and think about causes and qualities, etc. So, four in total by the time we get to the third edition. Rules one and two appear in all three editions. Rule three was added to the second edition and then maintained in the third edition without um, revision. And then rule four was added to the third. We'll look at all the statements of them uh, in due course, and there's a handout, so I hope everyone has one. It was at the door, great. Um, so let's just cut to the quick. What does rule three say? And this is at the very top, and, and I should note the handout, I, I learned this fancy new thing in Word, you can do line numbers. So when you open up to pages two and three, it's the whole text of the rules, and I will be referencing some of the line numbers there. Um, but for now, top of page one. Rule three, those qualities of bodies that cannot be intended and remitted, uh, and that belong to all bodies on which experiments can be made should be taken as qualities of all bodies universally. Sometimes this is called Newton's inductive rule because of the scope of the generalization. Sometimes it's called as his transductive rule because the generalization goes all the way down to the smallest parts. I'm just gonna call it a universalizing rule to be generic here. Now, what is the standard, sorry, <laughs> what is the standard reading? Um, and the only reading I know of other than mine, well, the translators of the 1999 translation of the Principia, I.B. Cohen, one of the translators, puts it this way. The message of rule three is that there is a certain set of qualities that are found in all bodies within the range of our direct experience on Earth, and two, do not vary, and that these are to be considered qualities of all bodies universally, that is, of bodies everywhere in the universe. What I'm calling the standard reading, what I call it, is the one set reading, because you'll notice, as Cohen puts it, there is one set of qualities that meets two conditions. So, this is also, this next slide, this text is on your handout. Rule three, the one set reading, the rule, th rule three identifies a single set of qualities that ought to be universalized, and it communicates that the members of this single set are qualities of bodies both that cannot be intended and remitted, and that belong to all bodies on which experiments can be made. My alternative, voila, the two-set reading. Rule three identifies two sets of qualities that ought to be universalized, and it communicates that members of one set are qualities of bodies that cannot be intended and remitted, and that members of the other set are qualities that belong to all bodies on which experiments can be made. Now, just to clarify, on both readings, rule three identifies two conditions that are to be met by qualities of bodies that the natural philosopher should regard as universal qualities. The difference is that on the one set reading, the two conditions are necessary and sufficient. 
On my reading, the two-set reading, the two conditions are sufficient, but not necessary. So another way to put it on my reading, rule three is an either or. So either there are qualities that um, cannot be intended and remitted, and we'll talk about what that means, or qualities belong to all bodies on which experiments can be made. And in either case, you can universalize to all bodies in general. One note here before you think I'm going off the rails. Um, the Latin construct, this is also on the top of the first page of your handout, the Latin construct of the sentence does allow for my reading. It allows it to be sufficient but not necessary conditions, and the construction is a que, que, cu. so in English, that, dot, 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 and that. Now, the reason it's possible in this case and not in all cases is because the subject of the sentence, qualities of bodies, is plural. When it's singular, and Newton uses this construction several times, about six times, five or six times in the Principia, if the subject term is singular, then it is necessary and sufficient, or sufficient and necessary. So there's an instance where he says the cause, and then uses the que, que, cu, and so the cause, that, this, and that, and so it has to meet both conditions. But when it's a plural, like it is here, the qualities of bodies, it can be one or the other. It can be necessary and sufficient, or sufficient but not necessary. So just to make the point that Newton knew this, he does it himself. So here's a case, and I won't go through the Latin, but just in English, um, the bobs of simple pendulums, that, blah, 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 and those, that. It's the same construct, que, que, cu, and here we have a plural. The reason we know in this case that it is sufficient but not necessary conditions is because the conditions are contradictory. It's impossible for the bobs of pendulums to meet both conditions. Why? Well, just to emphasize, the first condition states that they're in a resi being resisted in a medium. The second condition says they're in a non-resisting medium. So the bobs of sim simple pendulums that are resisted in a certain way and that are non-resisted in a certain way meet this other, or um, this consequence follows for both those cases. So here we know it's not necessary and sufficient. It can't be, it's impossible. In the case of rule three, it's not clear cut because there's no contradiction in the two conditions. To say that qualities cannot be intended and remitted and to say that they belong to all bodies on which experiments can be made, those can be fulfilled at the same time just in principle. So we don't get a clear case of sufficient but not necessary conditions but I'm claiming that that's what's happening with the two set. So to clarify, I've added in brackets here, the reading I'm giving, the two set reading of rule three, those qualities of bodies that cannot be intended or admitted, and those qualities of bodies that belong to all bodies on which experiments should be made, can be made, should be taken as qualities of all bodies universally. So he's talking about two different conditions, and only one has to be met to universalize the qualities. That's my reading. Now, you might wonder, after all this time, 300 plus years, why do we need a new reading? So the answer in brief is because on this reading, what I hope to show you in the course of this talk is that puzzles that arise for the one set reading, puzzles about how gravity is presented in the Precipia, completely disappear when you take this reading. It's also the case, as you'll see as we go forward, that to make the one set reading work, to show that the qualities have to meet both conditions, you have to go beyond the text. You have to go beyond what Newton explicitly says and make some assumptions about what he's doing in the text. On my reading, it just falls out. You don't have to do any of that. So I hope to show you this is a clearer, cleaner reading of the text. Now, to the one set reading and to clarify what these conditions are. So recall the one set reading, the rule stipulates two necessary and sufficient conditions for equality to be taken as belonging to all bodies universally. Namely, the quality cannot be intended and remitted and the quality belongs to all bodies on which experiments can be made. So what does this mean, cannot be intended and remitted? In the 99, 1999 translation, the translators insert immediately after that clause this in brackets, cannot be increased and diminished. And they do this to signal Newton's appropriation of what's called the medieval theory of forms. It's something he alluded to in other texts. And what that means, or what the medieval theory of forms indicates, is that a quality that cannot be intended and remitted is a quality that cannot be increased or augmented and diminished. It's a quality with a specifiable measure that cannot vary in degree. 
So to give you the contrast in case, it's maybe a little small, but qualities that can be intended and remitted are heat and cold. There are specific measures and they can go up and down. Weight, also up and down with a specific measure. There's no puzzle unto itself of Newton using this meaning of intended and remitted. The puzzle comes when we look at other texts where he's talking about gravity and whether it fulfills this specific condition. So you have to remember here, for all you readers of the Principia, that in the commentary to rule three, and this is lines 46 to 52 that I'm going to read from, um, from the, that's on your handout. In the commentary accompanying rule three, Newton claims that once appropriate empirical evidence has been collected, gravity can be universalized by rule three. So here's the text. Finally, if it is universally established by experiments and astronomical observations, one, that all bodies on or near the Earth gravitate, literally are heavy toward the Earth, and do so in proportion to the quantity of matter in each body, and two, that the moon gravitates as heavy toward the Earth in proportion to the quantity of its matter, and three, that our sea in turn gravitates is heavy toward the moon, and four, that all planets gravitate, are heavy toward one another, and five, that there's a similar gravity heaviness of comets toward the sun, it will have to be concluded by this third rule that all bodies gravitate toward one another. So he's presenting different kinds of evidence, but empirical evidence that there is this gravitation, and then says, therefore, by rule three, we can universalize gravity. But if you are using the one set reading of rule three, for rule three to apply, it also has to be the case that gravity cannot be intended and remitted. However, just a few lines later, line 56, Newton says gravity is diminished as bodies recede from the earth. So it seems as though he's saying it can be intended and remitted, which makes complete sense because gravity does have a specific measure that does vary in degree based on distance. So how can it be that rule three applies to gravity, as he says, and yet gravity doesn't fulfill one of the conditions. You already see where this is going, right? On the two set reading, we don't have this problem, but they do. Now, there is a way out of this, and so I'm going to present and 300 years of ways out of this, but I'm gonna present one way out of this um, from the one set reading to give you a sense of how much textual gymnastics you have to do to get this to work. Um, but there is one other puzzle and a more significant one to my mind that the two set reading is able to solve much more cleanly than the one set reading. But before I get there to the second puzzle, that's the first puzzle, I wanna do a little more stage setting and then talk about, uh, and it's in the stage setting that I'll present the second puzzle. Look at the use of the rules, how these are actually applied, how they function in the argument for universal gravitation before looking at how the one set and the two set readings compare when we apply those to the text. So some brief stage set, I'm painting with a very broad brush here just to get us to Leibniz's criticism that we'll talk about. So first I wanna talk very briefly about the metaphysical novelty of gravity. Um, it's gonna be two slides long, so you get it, it's very brief. Gravity, before Newton even, was the tendency of a body to fall towards another body. But before Newton, the scope was much narrower than it is in the Principia. Before Newton, gravity was attributed only to terrestrial bodies. Terrestrial bodies were understood to have a tendency to fall towards the Earth. But in the Principia, of course, gravity is taken to be universal. All bodies whatsoever have a tendency to fall not only towards the Earth, but toward all other bodies. Before Newton, also, it was understood that gravity is directly proportional to a body's weight or heaviness, or to spell this out a little, the stronger a body's force of gravity, it's tend the stronger its tendency to fall, the greater a body's weight or heaviness. Well, jump to Newton for a second on the bottom. As you know, weight or heaviness is dependent on mass, the amount of stuff in a body, or the quantity of matter. Right before Newton, prior to Newton, weight or heaviness was dependent, said to be dependent on the form or type of body. So to clarify this a little, because Newton rejects it explicitly right before he applies rule three in the third book, just take a moment here to clarify, and I'm gonna go to 1644 and Descartes' Principles of Philosophy. Um, so this is in brief, Descartes' account of gravity. There's a subtle ether filling all apparently empty spaces. So remember for Descartes, there's no vacuum. This ether has a tendency to move towards the heavens. And as it moves upwards, it pushes down on things that are near the earth. 
And so result number one, bodies near the surface of the earth have a tendency to fall to the earth, they exhibit a force of gravity, because they're being pushed downward by the ether. Result two, a body's gravity and weight depend on how much the body's surface is being impacted by that ether. Now, where does the form or type of body come into play? Descartes' own example. Given equal volumes of water and gold, the gold will weigh about 20 times more than the water. Why? Why does the water weigh less than the gold? Or to put it a little differently, why does water exhibit a weaker tendency to fall towards the earth than gold? Descartes' answer. The water has a lower weight than the gold because as a fluid body, the water is composed of particles that move more quickly than the particles of gold. And thus, in comparison to the gold, <coughs> the water's particles are impacted to a lesser degree by the globules of upward moving ether that surround it. So it's a mechanical model, it's about impact, ether moves up, pushes down, and if the body has particles that are moving more quickly, it will be impacted less by that ether. And that's why you get variation in weight, because of the type of body, the composition of the body itself. For Newton, this goes away. It's about the amount of stuff, mass, quantity of matter. So summing up, the metaphysical novelty of gravity, the scope uh, of Newton's gravity. Gravity is universal. All, bo all bodies whatsoever have a tendency to fall not only towards the Earth, but toward all other bodies. And also novel are the two laws that this gravity obeys. The gravity of a body is directly proportional to the body's mass or quantity of matter. And also, and we'll talk about this briefly in a little bit, the gravity of a body is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the body and the body towards which it is falling. Methodological novelty. So how does Newton establish that gravity is universal and obeys the two laws he has identified? Clearly, we could go on for days trying to answer this question. I'm just going to focus our attention on a path. This is on the bottom of the first page of your handout on a very um, well-known passage from the general scolium and then highlight just a few features of what he says in this passage to get us to Leibniz's criticism. Thus far, I have explained the phenomena of the heavens and of our sea by the force of gravity, but I've not yet assigned a cause to gravity. Indeed, this force of gravity arises from some cause that one penetrates as far as the centers of the sun and the planets without any diminution of its power to act, and that two acts not in proportion to the quantity of the surfaces of the particles on which it acts, touche Descartes, as mechanical causes are wont to do, but in proportion to the quantity of solid matter, and three, whose action is extended everywhere to immense dis distances, four, always decreasing as the squares of the distances. So he's not assigned a cause. He says there is this universal force. It obeys certain laws, but I don't know what in nature is producing it. I know it's there. I don't know what gives rise to it. So he's not giving us an ether model of like Descartes does. He knows that whatever the cause is, it has to have certain features, but he's still not going to tell us what it is. And then as he continues... He says, I have not as yet been able to deduce from phenomena the reason for these properties of gravity, and I do not feign hypotheses. For whatever is not deduced from the phenomena must be called a hypothesis. And hypotheses, whether metaphysical or physical, or based on occult qualities or mechanical, have no place in experimental philosophy. And experimental philosophy is the term of art he uses to try and distance his philosophy from the hypothetical philosophies of Descartes and Leibniz. In this philosophy, experimental philosophy, propositions are deduced from the phenomena and are made general by induction. The impenetrability, mobility, and impetus of bodies and the laws of motion and the law of gravity have been found by this method. And it is enough that gravity really exists and acts according to the laws that we have set forth and is sufficient to explain all the motions of the heavenly bodies and of our sea. So let's just distill a few key points here already emphasized. Oh, as he emphasizes in that passage I just read, he relies on empirical and experimental evidence. In his terms, he deduces propositions from the phenomena and makes them general by induction. He does not identify or speculate about the cause of gravity, about what natural conditions produce or give rise to the force of gravity that he's identified, and he does not use any hypotheses whatsoever. I want to focus, though, again, on him not speculating about the cause, because here's where Leibniz enters and says there's a problem. <clears throat> 
At first glance, this doesn't seem like a criticism, but we'll get there in a second. Um, according to Leibniz, having apparently ruled out the possibility that gravity acts by mechanical causes, if gravity really exists, and that's Newton's phrase, gravity really exists, this, he's not saving the phenomena, it's not some sort of um, hypothesis, there is really gravity out there. If it really exists as a quality of all bodies universally, then it must be essential to bodies. So we just saw a moment ago, Newton does rule out the possibility that this gravity he has identified is produced by mechanical causes. Now, why is this a criticism? that it has to be essential. Well, and I'm paraphrasing part of this is quotes from Leibniz, part of it's me. If we accept Newton's gravity as a real quality of bodies, <coughs> excuse me, and one that cannot be explained in terms of nature's mechanical operations, then, according to Leibniz, we must also accept that it is an unreasonable and very occult quality of bodies. In other words, if Newton's gravity really exists in nature, it must exist as a simple primitive quality that is essential to and inherent in a body and that itself produces motions without any intelligible means. So you might have heard the phrase action at a distance, right? That's the criticism. To have something like gravity and, not, and have it in nature such that it is not produced by mechanical means, must, it must be the case that it acts at a distance. For Leibniz and many others, this was unintelligible. I can't make sense of it. To make sense of how gravity operates, there has to be some kind of contact, like we saw with Descartes. And so to say that gravity for Newton must be essential, it must be inherent, means that it has to act immediately, instantaneously, at a distance. And that is unintelligible. That's the basic criticism. Now, in the third edition, this, this comes out um, in the early 18th century, actually immediately after the first edition, but in the early 18th century. And so in the second, and in the third, sorry, in the third edition, Newton adds a couple lines, one of which we've already seen, is a response to the criticism. Yet, I am by no means affirming that gravity is essential to bodies. By inherent force, I mean only the force of inertia. This is immutable. Gravity is diminished as bodies recede from the earth. Now, I already noted the puzzle about this last sentence that Newton says, you rule three can be used to universalize gravity, and yet gravity is diminished. But there's another problem here in this lead up. He's suggesting here that there is some essential difference, sorry, I shouldn't use essential, some salient, very significant difference between inertia and gravity such that only inertia should be considered essential and gravity should not. And my claim, as we go forward, because the question then, what is this robust difference or significant difference between the two forces? I'll show you how the one set reading tries to account for this, and it gets very murky quickly. Um, but my claim, as we go along, is that on the two set reading, like with the other puzzle, we get a much straightforward answer here. There is a way of understanding, and I'll just give away the ending, of why inertia is, should be considered essential and gravity shouldn't. Of the two, only inertia is one that cannot be intended and remitted. Only it has a specific measure that does not vary given a quantity of matter or given a body. So that option is not available on the, the one set reading because you have to fulfill both conditions of rule three to universalize. Okay, so that's the basic setup. Now let's talk a little bit about how the rules are used in the argument for universal gravity. Generally speaking, I said this before, the rules are directives for how the natural philosopher ought to reason about natural evidence. So you might recall at the opening we get the definitions, we get the laws of motion, we get the author's preface. Book one, book two, math, he calls it the mathematical treatment of motion, first in non-resisting media, then resisting media. And again, it's in book three that he gives us his system of the world. And so these directives, these four rules, tell the natural philosopher how, now to, how to reason about evidence now that we're gonna talk about the way the world actually operates. Not just talk about mathematics, but the world itself. All the rules are premised on the assumption that nature operates and is ordered simply economically and uniformly. So this is on your handout lines 11 and 12, he says things like this. As the philosophers say, nature does nothing in vain, and more causes are in vain when fewer suffice. For nature is simple and does not indulge in the luxury of superfluous causes. 
Along similar lines, this is lines 23 through 25. This is in the commentary to rule three. Certainly, idle fancies ought not to be fabricated recklessly against the evidence of experiment, nor should we depart from the analogy of nature, since nature is always simple and ever consonant with itself. So there is simplicity, there's order, there's economy, not only between different bodies, but also in bodies themselves, the part-whole relationship. So very famously, he says, this is lines 34 through 38 on the handout. This also in the commentary to rule three, the extension, hardness, and penetrability, mobility, and force of inertia of the whole, of a whole body, arise from the extension, hardness, and penetrability, mobility, and force of inertia of each of the parts. Now, this is sort of the orator. It's generic. It originates from. It's not causal in some produces way, but you have extension and hardness in the whole because of the parts themselves. So tables are extended because the parts of tables are extended, right? There's no robust causal connection going on here. Um, and thus we conclude that every one of the least parts of all bodies is extended, hard, impenetrable, movable, and endowed with the force of inertia, and this is the foundation of all natural philosophy. So this sometimes is called this transductive principle that all the way down to the parts, you have this uniformity from part to whole. This is not argued for, the simplicity and uniformity of nature. It's just stated in the commentaries to the rules. So that's why I said a moment ago, the rules are based on this assumption. It's not something he takes, makes any effort to try and convince you of. He just takes it to be the case that you already know this as a reader of the Principia. So finally, what are all, th all four of the rules? We already saw rule three, but rule one. No more causes of natural things should be admitted than are both true and sufficient to explain their phenomena. And sorry, this is lines nine through 10 on the handout. And so this is about the number of causes. Therefore, the causes assigned to natural effects of the same kind must be so far as possible the same. So if you have same effect, you should assign the same cause. Rule three, I'll skip. You're gonna hear this one over and over again anyway. And then rule four, which he adds to the third edition, really is a caution about how to understand claims made based on empirical evidence. In experimental philosophy, propositions gathered from phenomena by induction should be considered either exactly or very nearly true, notwithstanding any contrary hypotheses, until yet other phenomena make such propositions either more exact or liable to exceptions. So you can accept them to be exactly or very nearly true, but also always keep in mind if other evidence comes along, you might have to revise your claims. Now, in the argument for universal gravity in, in book three, the rules, rules one and two are referenced three times total. Rule three is referenced once explicitly and rule four is, is um, explicitly referenced once. So I wanna look at a couple cases of the application of this so you see how they function, what they do for the argument itself. And basically, as I'm gonna emphasize, by using the rules, what Newton is able to do in his argument is go from experimental bodies, bodies on which he made experiments, to, to all experimental bodies, and then to bodies on which experiments can't be made, the sun, the planets, et cetera. So the first instance of applying rules one and two um, I'm starting us at, at proposition three of book three. In propositions one and two, he's, he's established that an inverse square force can explain the orbital motion of the sun, uh, sorry, the moons of Jupiter around Jupiter, the moons of Saturn around Saturn, um, et cetera. And then in proposition three, and this is all paraphrased, this is not a quote, an inverse square centripetal force can be used to explain the orbital motion of the moon around the Earth. Then in the corollary to 3.3, 3, he states that, or shows that, an inverse square centripetal force can be used to explain the motion of the moon if the moon were to fall toward the Earth. From here, we go down to four. The moon has a force of gravity, a tendency to fall toward the Earth, that obeys an inverse square law. Or, to put the point <laughs> more pointedly, the moon has a force of gravity that just is an inverse square force. The move here is significant, it's probably not lost on any of you, right? You can, you can, an inverse square force can explain the orbital motion that's observed of the moon around the Earth. And now once we get to three, four, what we have as a statement is that the reason you can use an inverse square force 
put it one way. The reason you can use an inverse square force to explain the orbital motion of the moon around the Earth is because the moon has a force of gravity that is an inverse square force. There is a single force, gravity, that obeys an inverse square law, to put it differently. How does he get us there? Two steps. Terrestrial, he's going, and this, so what I have here in the middle, this is what he gives us in the proof to 3 4. He's going to establish 3 4. He first shows that terrestrial bodies have a for, terrestrial earthly bodies have a force of gravity that is governed by an inverse square law. And then by application of rules one and two, he goes from terrestrial bodies to the moon. Okay? So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, but hopefully it will make sense. Here's what he does. And also, is it on here? Yeah, remember in the corollary he says that an inverse square centripetal force could be used to explain the motion of the moon if it were let fall. This is where we begin the proof. He's going to imagine that the moon is allowed to fall in the proof for 3-4. He imagines that the moon is allowed to fall to the earth. He calculates the moon's rate of fall near the surface of the earth. And then he appeals to experimental results from Huygens to establish that terrestrial bodies have the same rate of fall near the surface as the imagined falling moon. So this is how he establishes that the fall of earthly bodies is governed by an inverse square law. He's using the moon to get an inverse square force here on Earth, and then he's going to double back in a second and apply that back to the moon using rules one and two. So result number one of this, the fall of terrestrial bodies can be explained by an inverse square force. And then result two, and this is in a one, not even a one sentence reductio, the gravity of terrestrial bodies, their tendency to fall is an inverse square force. The reductio goes like this. Let's say there are two forces. There's a force of gravity and this inverse square force. Well, that, that can't work. And then it's basically because it's a contradiction and he doesn't say much more. Why is it a contradiction? Because if you have two forces, they should fall at double the rate that Huygens actually observed. So observation shows they fall at the rate of only one force, not two. If you compounded them, they should fall twice as quickly as Huygens saw. Contradiction because Huygens saw them not fall that way. All of this is very quick, as those of you know who have read the book. Um, so this is how he gets this very important claim. Terrestrial bodies have a force of gravity that is governed by an inverse square law, okay? Now, he applies rules one and two to get us that the moon has a single force of gravity. And how does this go? Just as quickly. This is the sentence, and it's part of a sentence. That force by which the moon is kept in its orbit in descending from the moon's orbit to the surface of the earth comes out equal to the force of gravity here on earth. And so, it's even parenthetical, by rules one and two is that very force which we generally call gravity. This is how he extends terrestrial gravity to the moon and says it's the same, rules one and two. Let's unpack just a little. How does this work? Well, remember rule one. No more causes of natural things should be admitted that are both true and sufficient to explain their phenomena. So what's happening here? A single cause explains the downward motion of terrestrial bodies. So we should assume a single cause can be used to explain the downward motion of the moon in his imaginary falling moon. You only needed one in the case of earthly bodies. That suggests you only need a single cause in the case of the moon. Why the same cause? That's rule two. Therefore, the cause assigned to natural effects of the same kind must be so far as possible the same. The motion of terrestrial bodies and the motion of the moon are motions according to an inverse square centripetal force. In other words, these motions are effects of the same kind. So by rule two, they should be assigned the same cause. So why is it that terrestrial bodies, the fall of terrestrial bodies can be explained by an inverse square force because it's, that's their force of gravity. It's an inverse square force. So we should do exactly the same thing with the moon. It, the effect, the motion that's explainable by an inverse square force, it's the same as what we have on Earth, so it's the same cause. Single cause and then same cause. And that is the end of the proof to get us to number, to get us to three, four. The moon has a force of gravity, a tendency to fall towards the Earth that just is an inverse square force. Now, just as quickly, when we get to 3-5, and I'm not going to go through the steps, except that 
Well, actually I am because it's one sentence. Hitherto, we have called centripetal that force by which celestial bodies are kept in their orbits. It's now established that this force is gravity. And therefore, we shall call it gravity from now on. For the cause of the centripetal force by which the moon is kept in its orbit ought to be extended to all the planets by rules one, two, and four. Again, single cause, same cause, and now with rule four, adding that in, but be careful because if other evidence comes, we might have to revise this. That's the addition of rule four. And that's it. He went from terrestrial bodies having an inverse square force of gravity to the moon having the same kind of force of gravity and now to the circumjovial planets having the same inverse square force of gravity. Rules one, two, and four. And here's the scheme to keep in mind, how this reasoning goes. He's reasoning from bodies on which experiments have been made. The pendulum experiments of Huygens are key here. Without that, he cannot get that the fall of terrestrial bodies happens or can be explained by an inverse square force. He goes from that to all terrestrial bodies, or all bodies on which, to put this in terms of rule three, all bodies on which experiments can be made, and then to bodies on which experiments cannot be made, the moon the planets, et cetera. Now I want to emphasize one thing here before we get on to rule three. This is where we get gravity as an inverse square force using rules one, two, and four, but also, more importantly, in going from the top to the middle, reasoning from bodies on which experiments have been made to all terrestrial bodies or bodies on which experiments can be made, this, to me, I would call the inductive step. This is the generalization from some terrestrial to all terrestrial, from some experimental to all. This is induction. Rule three then is the universalization to all bodies whatsoever, right? So when he says in rule three that qualities of bodies, and let's forget intended and remitted, those qualities of bodies that belong to all bodies on which experiments can be made, he's already made an inductive step. And then he's going to apply rule three and make the universalizing step. And that's what we're going to see now when we get to the application of rule three in the argument for universal gravity. In this case, though, um, same basic scheme. Experiments have been, bodies on in which experiments have been made, all bodies can be made, blah, 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 blah. But more importantly, filling in some details. The experiment now is Newton's own. It's not Huygens' anymore. He conducted some experiments. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then, to all bodies on which experiments can be made, and then an explicit reference to rule three to get to this statement here in the red on the bottom, to all bodies universally, including all those bodies that are equidistant from the center of the earth. So in on my reading, all, use, all uses of the rules have the same basic format, or they function in the same basic way. They get him from something he has control over, or Huygens did, to a larger store of bodies through induction, and then to things that he cannot conduct experiments on. And that's how the general, that's how generally, um, gravity gets universalized in book three. So what is this experiment that, and, and so, oh, sorry, one more thing. In the application of rule three, so in, with one, two, and four, we got gravity is an inverse square force. With the application of rule three, we are now universalizing the proportionality of weight and mass. So remember, it, would all, it was already understood that gravity and weight had some relationship, that the, the stronger the force of gravity, the heavier a body will be. It's in these next few steps of book three that Newton is gonna tie this together with mass, that weight and mass go together, and then by the time we get to three seven is when he gets gravity and mass together, okay? But for the, the, the middle step there is to get the relationship or direct proportionality between weight and mass, and this is where rule three comes in. So, the pendulum experiments. I have tested the equality of the times of fall <coughs> with gold, silver, lead, glass, sand, common salt, wood, water, and wheat. I got two wooden boxes, round and equal. I filled one of them with wood, and I suspended the same weight of gold as exactly as I could in the center of oscillation of the other. The boxes hanging by equal 11 foot cords made pendulums exactly like each other with respect to their weight, shape, and air resistance. Then when placed close to each other and set into vibration, they kept swinging back and forth together with equal oscillations for a very long time. 
So you'll notice, as he describes it at least, the setup was such that everything was the same except the composition of the bobs. The distance was the same, the air resistance was the same, the weight exact, as exactly as he could, they were the same. So all the only difference in the first go round was that you have wood versus gold. Everything else is equal. And then he's gonna go through all the others. And the result, all the other, uh, sorry, all the other kinds of things he's talking about, salt and wood um, and wheat and lead and glass. The key results he reports. And here he's appealing to some results from book two. The masses of the golden wood bobs are directly proportional to their respective weights. That's what he finds in the first iteration of the experiment. And he finds then generally in all cases, regardless of the composition of the bobs, the masses of the bobs are directly proportional to their respective weights. So as you vary the weights, remember the way he describes it, the weights are the same, but what he's saying, when he's saying they're directly proportional, if you made it, I'm just gonna use an example, 10 pounds and 10 pounds, as, and then you made it 20 and 20, as you double that, the mass would double of the things that the bobs were made of, right? So there's a direct purport, you double the weight, you're gonna double the mass. And then these things would still swing in equal time. So it's not equality, it's proportionality, right? Um, I went the wrong way, sorry. This way, so we get in all cases, regardless of the composition of the bobs, the mass of the bobs are directly proportional to their respective weights. Now three, six. What he says here, all bodies gravitate toward each of the planets, and at any given distance from the center of any one planet, the weight of any body whatever toward that planet is proportional to the quantity of matter which the body contains. So again, we're talking about equal distances, just like in the pendulums, 11 foot, 11 foot, 11 foot. So here, at any given distance, so take wood, take gold, take lead, take the salt, from any given distance whatsoever, there will be this direct proportionality between weight and mass or quantity of matter. After he establishes this using his experiment, his experimental result, notice what he does in the first corollary of 3.6. He gets, he dismisses, proves, allegedly, proves that Descartes wrong. The weight of bodies do not depend on their forms and textures. And there is a bit of a commentary about why Descartes wrong. It's the next corollary though that for our purposes is important because this is the one and only case in which he explicitly references rule three. Here's the corollary. All bodies universally that are on or near the earth are heavy or gravitate toward the earth and the weights of all bodies that are equally, distance from, equally distant from the center of the earth are as the quantities of matter in them. And here's the proof. This is a quality of all bodies on which experiments can be performed and therefore by rule three is to be affirmed of all bodies universally. So to put it a little differently, the proportionality between weight and mass is universalized to all bodies by rule three, all bodies universally, right? And the proportionality thus applies to all bodies equidistant from the center of the earth. And again, Notice the functionality of rule three is the same as the function, how rules one, two, and four function. It gets him from bodies on which experiments have been made to bodies on which experiments can be made, and now to bodies on which experiments cannot be made. All bodies equidistant from the center of the earth, whether it be a star, a planet, whatever, what have you. So we have the same function. But the question here as we get to the one set versus two set reading is what makes rule three applicable? Why can it be applied? And well, we just saw what he said. He said, it's a quality of all bodies on which experiments can be made and therefore by rule three. He, he explicitly references one condition of rule three. But uh, now we have to talk about the one set reading. If you're a person who takes the one set reading of rule three, it has to meet both conditions. Newton only says it meets one, but again, on the one set reading, these are necessary and sufficient conditions. So there has to be a way in which we have to understand the proportionality between weight and mass such that it cannot be intended and remitted. And this is where things get murky. What does that mean? He says that only that one thing, rule three says you have to meet both on the one set reading. I'll just skip that quickly. So here's the question on the table for the one set reading. 
in what sense is the proportionality between weight and mass a quality that cannot be intended and remitted? Well, it can't be the standard medieval sense because again, as I said before, the standard medieval sense was this, that it's a quality to not be intended, unable to be intended and remitted. It's a quality that cannot be increased or augmented and diminished. It's a quality with a specifiable measure that cannot vary in degree. But we're talking about a proportion. We're not talking, weight and mass has measure, but the proportionality somehow cannot be intended and remitted. So what commentators suggest when we talk about the commentators who adopt the one set reading, in what sense is this proportionality one that cannot vary in degree? Here's sort of kind of the answer. I'm, I'm sort of kind of and then I'm taking a lot of different answers and trying putting it in a simple form. The proportionality between weight and mass can be counted as a quality that cannot be intended and remitted insofar as it is a quantifiable, quantifiable mathematical relation that remains invariant, even as the specific measures of a body's weight are increased or decreased. So on this reading, what we're supposed to do is focus not on the specific measures at play, the weights and the mass, masses, but on the fact that we have a mathematical relationship that's invariant. And they say, this is what Newton means. He never says that's what he means, but this is what Newton means when he says, but it doesn't actually say, that the proportion cannot be intended and remitted. You see where I'm going with this. It has to meet the condition. He never says it does, but if he's going to say it does, as the one set reading, those who adopt the one set reading of rule three have to um, except this is how they go along, this is how they interpret cannot be intended and remitted in this context. Ultimately though, it's helpful because it helps them solve the problem of gravity. The problem that Newton says, if there is, and I'm not gonna reread this, if there's adequate evidence, then by rule three, you can universalize gravity. And then, of course, the problem being that he says gravity can be diminished, so hey, doesn't that mean it doesn't fulfill the conditions of rule three? Well, drawing on the way they read the corollary, corollary two of three, six, they say, same idea here. Newton isn't, yes, specific measures of gravity go up and down as distance varies, but the general measure of gravity is what we have to focus on, and this is why it cannot be intended and remitted. Namely, the general measure of gravity does not increase and decrease insofar as the general measure is defined by an invariant proportion. Namely, it always bears the same mathematical relationship to mass, is directly proportional. So the same way folks who adopt the one set reading make sense of corollary two of three six, they adopt the same reading to try and solve this puzzle about how it can be that gravity cannot be intended and remitted, even though Newton says it diminishes. Invariant proportionality, invariant rela mathematical relationship. And so just to highlight this, same basic idea, same notion of cannot be intended and remitted is applied in both of these cases. And so there's a nice consistency here. But we do get a problem going on to the other issue, the other puzzle having to do with inertia. So gravity cannot be intended remitted in this specific way, right? But then we have Leibniz's criticism. I'm not gonna reread all this, but according to Leibniz, it, uh, Newton says it's not caused by mechanical means, therefore it has to be essential. Newton says, no, no, I didn't say that's essential. I said only inertia is essential. Now we're still with the one set reading. Question, what is the difference between how inertia and gravity are presented in the Principia such that one should be accepted as essential and the other should not? My claim, the difference if on the one set reading is not entirely clear, and here's why it's not entirely clear. We just saw gravity on the one set reading for many commentators, it cannot be intended and remitted because um, the general measure is defined by an invariant proportion, namely it always bears the same mathematical relationship to mass. Well, inertia also, clearly for Newton, is a quality that cannot be intended and remitted. But in this case, the specific measure of inertia, of, of the inertia of a body does not increase and decrease insofar as the measure varies directly with the body's mass and any change of mass is a change of body. So I'm paraphrasing a lot here, putting a lot in here. Definition one at the beginning of the Principia is where he says that body is mass, right? Any quantity of mass or matter 
is, sorry, any quantity of matter or any piece of mass is body. So if you change a bit of the mass, you've changed the body. Any change of body is a change of inertia comes in definition three. Inherent force of matter is the power of, re of resisting by which every body, so far as it is able, perseveres in its state either of resting or of moving uniformly straight forward. This force is always proportional to the body and does not differ in any way from the inertia of the mass except in the manner in which it is conceived. Because of the inertia of matter, every body is only with difficulty put out of its state either of resting or of moving. Consequently, inherent force may also be called by the very significant name of force of inertia. Okay, cannot be intended and remitted in the medieval sense, right? So the specific measure of the inertia of a body does not increase and decrease insofar as this measure varies direct. This measure varies directly with the body's mass, and any change of mass is a change of body. The general measure of a body's gravity does not increase or decrease insofar as this measure is defined by an invariant proportion. Namely, it always bears the same mathematical relationship to mass. Here's the lingering problem among commentators on the one set reading. This is the lingering question. Why does only the invariance that characterizes the measure of a body's inertia give us grounds to consider it a quality that is essential to and inherent in a body? So remember, that's Newton's, Newton's general claim. No, no, Leibniz, only inertia is essential. There's a big difference. Well, what's the big difference? It doesn't seem so big on this reading. They're both quality, both forces, inertia and gravity, in some specific way, cannot be intended and remitted. So what's the difference? And so you might say, well, one. Let me go the other way. Uh, sorry. This way? Well, one has to do with specific measure, and one has to do with general measure. But this is when things get very murky in the commentaries. Why should that matter? They're both related, both the general measure and the specific measure, inertia in one case, gravity in the other, are related to mass. And so people have to do, commentators have to do a lot of um, gymnastics with the text and with trying to make sense of why this is some sort of significant difference. Me, much cleaner. Two set reading. This is gonna go super quick. It's almost anticlimactic because this is gonna be like, duh, right? Two set reading, one or the other. Uh, conditions are sufficient but not necessary. Basic claim on my reading, Newton never says gravity cannot be intended and remitted, so guess what? It's not one of those. It's only one of the others. No problem. We're done. Two set reading, members of one set, blah, blah, members of the other, blah, blah. You see, we'll see where this is going. Uh, two set reading, the qualities of bodies that one or the other. It's an either or statement he's saying. So when he says that in corollary two of three six that rule three applies, why does it apply? Well, because he said it's something on which experiments can be performed, right? It's a quality of that. It, it fulfills one condition. We're done. That's it. Why can you universalize gravity using rule three? Well, look at all this evidence. It's also a quality that seems to be one that belongs to all bodies on which experiments can be performed. Done. That's it. No intended remitted needed. No, none of that commentary, none of that interpretation. It just fulfills one of the conditions. And on the two set reading, that's all that's needed. So now we get to this one. What's the robust difference between how inertia and gravity are presented in the Principia? Only Inertia is one that cannot be intended and remitted. That's the difference. Now, what's the real upshot of this, right? So all those puzzles go away. That's what I meant. You know, you have to do a bunch of gymnastics with the one set reading, go beyond what Newton explicitly says to try and make sense of what he's suggesting because they've read the rule three as, having, as, being, as giving us necessary and sufficient conditions when Newton never says that. Um, on this one, those puzzles disappear. But what then is the upshot? So the puzzles disappear. Inertia, and this is what's key in the medieval sense, can, is a quality that cannot be intended and remitted. Gravity is not a quality that cannot be, it can be, intended, it does vary, right? Um, yeah, in relation to distance. In relation to distance, and I should go back one, inertia, it, doesn't matter 
how distant a body is from any other body, inertia will always be of a body the same, of a quantity of matter. Went the wrong way. But gravity will vary in relation to distance. So key takeaway here, one key takeaway on this reading in trying to understand why Newton might have made him, made these conditions sufficient but not necessary. Evidence indicates that inertia is essential to and inherent in a body because a change in a body's location relative to other bodies will not change the specific measure of a body's inertia. Evidence does not indicate that gravity is essential to or inherent in a body because a change in a body's location relative to other bodies will change the specific measure of a body's gravity. One belongs to a body, inertia belongs essentially to it. No matter where the thing is, it will have the same inertia because it has the same quantity of matter. Not so of gravity. Distance changes, so too does gravity. The measure, the specific measure. Evidence indicates that a body's inertia is not dependent on a body's relation to other bodies. Evidence indicates that a body's gravity is dependent on a body's relation to other bodies. Therefore, evidence indicates that of the two forces, only inertia is essential to and inherent in bodies, that it will be there and remain as such no matter where it's located relative to anything else. So, on my picture, on this two-set reading, Equalities of bodies must fulfill both of the conditions identified in Rule 3, in, may fulfill, sorry, and in such a case we have evidence that the quality is universal and essential, that it belongs to all bodies and will belong to a body no matter its relation to other bodies. But a quality of bodies may fulfill just one of the conditions, like gravity, one of the conditions identified in Rule 3. In such a case we have evidence that the quality is universal but inadequate grounds for considering it a quality that is inherent in and essential to bodies. Or to put this a little differently, the upshot of the reading I'm giving here of rule three and of the, the way he distinguishes inertia and gravity, he has set the bar pretty high for a quality of bodies to be universal. You have to fulfill one of these very, one of two very strong conditions. But he set the bar even higher for us to say that we have evidence that a quality is essential to bodies. And this is the kind of distinction we can see on the two-set reading that the one-set reading doesn't give us. Because if you have to fulfill both conditions to be universalized, it's not clear then what makes one essential and the other not. Where here, two conditions fulfill one universal, fulfill both universal and essential. And that, I think, for me, is the major upshot of this two-set reading. Thank you.